Blessings, church family. Today's scripture reading is found in Romans 5, 1 to 5. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. There are some who I haven't seen in a long time, and I'm really glad you're here. I know that today is very, very special because of our love for our Joe. And I have good news. You're thinking, oh, she's not going. No, no. uh, The pull of family is a very strong one, and I am uh, very happy that she is doing what she's doing. But... Uh, she has consented, uh, yea, volunteered, to be the person to whom we can still ask for prayer. So she's not changing her telephone number or her email. And so when you feel the need to bring someone into the presence of God and you would like our prayer team to pray for you or your loved ones, please continue to call Joe. She will answer in Arkansas, but she wanted this because she wants to stay connected to us, uh, and I want to stay connected to her. So that is, that's the good news that uh, because of technology, uh, we don't have to be completely uh, separated. I don't know about you, but with my children living far, far away to the north. I'm just going to say hi to them if they happen to be watching today, uh, because they do. They watch from Calgary, Canada, where this week it has been 35 below. Can you say amen? I live in Southern California. (laughs) This This is the weather, folks. This is why people from Calgary leave their homes and come to Palm Desert and Palm Springs and and other parts of Southern California to stay for a while. Uh, why, uh, you know, they even go even further south to, to Mexico. Uh, it is because, um, as my son Callan was uh, complaining this week, that Calgary is boring. Uh, and that's probably because he's getting a little stir crazy, having to be inside so, so much. It is, it is kind of crazy to, to think about, but there are literally hundreds of thousands, even millions of people that live in that cold. And uh, uh, as it got down to, well, did we get to zero, I think, uh, or zero Fahrenheit, uh, excuse me, zero Celsius, uh, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, I think we got close to that this week in, in Santa Clarita, and that uh, was cold enough. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Uh, we had little little icicles here and there, um, so I do think I do think about those individuals that are part of a growing group of Americans who do not have uh, appropriate shelter. So um, I was reading something in the newspaper about that this week, and I am uh, more and more convinced that we we need to help uh, to raise our voices to offer. Uh, assistance to individuals who uh, may need better shelter. Uh, This is not a problem, I believe, that is going away. It is a problem that is is growing, and um, we are not immune to this here in Santa Clarita. So uh, understand that uh, there are many, and I mean many, individuals who who, uh, would like to see something done that would be positive because I'm going to say this because of my love this morning. I love being an American. I'm proud. I'm serious. I've traveled this world over and I am proud to be an American. And I believe that we have 
the technology. We have the power. We have the love. We have the love, I do believe, to take care of our fellow Americans, uh, many of whom are veterans, many of whom have suffered in ways that we cannot even begin to understand. And uh, I am hoping that we can love, hopefully. The story that I have decided to, to bring to you today is, is one, again, of, of intrigue and, and, and something that we, we may have thought about in the last 10 years, uh, but maybe you haven't. I want to remind us of the story of Abram, and at this point in his life, he's Abram and not Abraham yet. He will become Abraham, but he's Abram, and he is the uh, brother of a guy who had died named Nahor. Uh, yes? No. Tira? Who was, who was his brother? It wasn't Nahor. Nahor was his uncle. Anyway, he had died, and his father, Tira, who was called before him, had not continued the journey and had stayed where his brother had died. And so Abram gets the call from God, and God indicates that he should take his brother's son, his nephew Lot, with him. And so Lot, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it's a good pun, Eric, I don't know, but he throws his lot in with his uncle. And together they journey to the, the land of Canaan, which God had promised that he would eventually give to the descendants of Abram. It was a land that he had not been a part of originally. And so they, they start living in this land and their, their, their flocks and herds get so big that it becomes difficult to graze them together, and so they decide to separate. As the story goes, you, 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 you may, uh, may be remembering now that uh, Lot chooses to live in the fertile plains that are headed down towards what we know today as the Dead Sea, the uh, plain where the two, the two twin cities were of Sodom and Gomorrah. And slowly but surely, the economy of the day, the convenience of shopping, you know, I mean, he moves closer and closer to Sodom until finally he decides, <laughs> I don't need to live in a tent out here. I can live in town in that brick and mortar house that my wife has been wanting. And he's got the money, and he's got the prestige, and so he decides to move into town. The Bible tells us that there were marauding kings that would go around and would capture whatever they could and then go home with it. And so if you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14, we come across this very interesting story where... These kings led by, and I'm going I'm to get my glasses out because it's one of those amazing names, Kedor La, um, Laomar, Kedor Laomer. So we, we, we'll name him as the bad guy in the story. Okay, Kedor Laomer and his allies arrived and defeated the Rephaites at Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzites at Ham, the Emites at Shev Kiriatim, and the Horites at Mount Seir, as far as El Paran at the edge of the wilderness. So you have one group of kings that comes into battle with the kings of Canaan. The Bible actually says that there was kind of five against four, plus their armies. But the cumulative result was that the king of Sodom loses. And he and his army are scattered, and the people of Sodom are taken into captivity. As you now know, one of the inhabitants of Sodom was 
Lot, the nephew of Abram. Now, in the division of land that they had done before, Abram had decided to live up on the mountains. It was safer. Uh, he, 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 he knew that it wasn't as good a pasture, but he wanted to give his, his nephew all the advantages, and so he did. But those advantages led him to this day when he was captured with his wife and children and was taken by Kido Loomar into captivity. Well, not to allow this to just go by easily, Abram gathers up the able-bodied fighting men in his family. Now, the families of those days, as you may have studied, were extended and extended and extended. And if you were a servant of a person like Abram, you had children in that family, and you were considered part of that family. And so when Abram came to Canaan, it's likely that his extended family was 70 to 100 people. So now, now things have, have gone on, time has passed, and there are, the Bible says, 318 fighting men. But haven't we just heard that there were five kings that attacked? Yes, there were. So you're thinking, how would he even think about going after his nephew with only 318? But the fact is, he's not alone. He is the worshiper of the great God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Thank you for being here today, my friends, because by you sitting here in these pews on this day, you are saying... I am worshiping the great God of the universe, the creator of all things. It is a statement that needs to be made not only by our presence, but by the way in which we live in his kingdom, which uh, Denise and I were telling the kids about this very morning. We have a choice, my friends, to be in the kingdom of heaven or to be in the kingdom of this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, but that my kingdom has come into this world is also a fact. And so we live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven in the valley of the shadow of death, knowing that because we have chosen this, because we have chosen to believe because we have chosen to have faith that we are servants like Abram of the Most High God, the creator of heaven and earth. So chapter 14, verse 14 says, when Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men who had been born in his household. Then he pursued Kido Laomar's army until he caught up with them at Dan. Now, you have to know your Bible geography to understand the distance involved, and it's not short. They really hoofed it, let me tell you. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. Kido Laomar's army fled, but Abram chased them as far as Hobah, North of Damascus. Now, we know Damascus today is in what country? Syria. Okay. So this was still part of Abram's day. It was named Damascus in that day, and it's still named Damascus now. But he chased them from Canaan all the way to Damascus. Abram recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions all of Lot's possessions as well, and all the women and other captives. It was a very successful rescue uh, action. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if we were making uh, uh, biblical-based movies, that this would be a good one. This would really be a good one. So all those aspiring uh, movie makers out there, take a look at this story. It's, it's really good. It's really great because it has a fantastic uh, ending. Okay, we, we like good endings like this. 
returned from victory over Kedalormar and all his allies, allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, which is the king's valley. And here's an interesting piece that, uh, that we often talk about uh, at the moment of talking about tithe. Okay? But understand that this piece is in this context. The context is the rescue of Lot. And Melchizedek, which you take the two parts of that name, Melchi, meaning king, and Zedek, meaning righteous. So the righteous king of what city? Shalom. Shalem. Salam. Salem. Are you catching who this might be? And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God, most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of the heaven and earth. He, and blessed be God most high, who, who has defeated your enemies for you. So you're catching the significance here of this particular passage. He only took 318 with him. That was faith. Faith in God most high. And when he returns, Melchizedek recognizes the fact that it was not Abram that won the battle. It was not Abram that effected the rescue of his nephew. It was God Most High. And here, here uh, Abram brings him an offering. Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods that he had recovered. Now, we're, we're talking to, uh, in, in, in uh, pirate terms. Can I talk in pirate terms for a moment? Um, booty. Okay, before it meant what we think it means today, it meant the spoils of war. And so he had recovered. What you're reading here in this, this epic story is that Abram had not only recovered the people, including his, his nephew, who was probably doomed to servitude with Kiolodomar, but he also recovered all of their possessions, which is what the kings had been after in the first place. They wanted slaves, and they also wanted their possessions, and they had come through the valley, and they had taken everything from Sodom and Gomorrah because they lost. Abram gets it all back, all of it. It's an amazing story. This is, this is why I'm saying make a great movie. He gives him a tenth. He gives him a tenth on behalf of, of all the people whose things had been taken. He gives their stuff have you gathered that? He gives their stuff, one-tenth he gives to Melchizedek. Now here comes, the, here comes the king of Sodom. You ready? Verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give back my people who were captured. Because you see, in this situation, by rights, Abram should have been allowed to keep these same people to be his slaves, to be part of his family now, because this is how these, these warlords would do it. They came for people, for slaves, and they came for their goods. But now the king of Sodom is coming to do some bargaining, and he says, give back my people, but you may keep for yourself all the goods you have recovered. Listen, listen to what Abram says to him. Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Okay, this is the name that he uses for his God. It's the name Seventh-day Adventists still use. That I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal thong from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say, I 
this is the king of Sodom, might say, I am the one who made Abram rich. Now do you see why this whole tenth and this whole tithe thing is such a teaching mechanism? It is a teaching mechanism to say, who's going to make you wealthy? Who's going to take care of you? When the chips are down, when you feel rescued, who are you going to give credit to? Are you going to give credit to the God Most High, the creator of heaven and earth, and his representative, which in this case is named Melchizedek, Melchizedek? Or are you going to think that it was the king of Sodom who made you rich? Interesting that when we take up tithes and offerings in this church, my hope as pastor is that you are thinking about the fact that it is the God of heaven most high who has given you life for yet another week in this world. And that he has said, here's how you can recognize me. Just a tenth. A tenth. A tiny little tenth. That's all that I will ask of you to recognize me for giving you life and for sustaining you. So just keep it in context. It's this wonderful rescue story we're talking about. And if you feel like you are Lot today and that you have been taken off into captivity in this world by Kedalomar and you are now feeling like you have just been rescued by Abram and his 318, then maybe you're going to be just really, really happy that a tenth of your stuff is given to Melchizedek. Verse uh, chapter 15. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I will protect you and your reward will be great. So he gets into a conversation here in chapter 15 with God and he talks to him about how this greatness is going to take place. And I want you to say, I want to say to you today, suffice it to say that in this passage, it is, it, it is very logical from a human perspective. It is very logical from uh, uh, our uh, depth of knowledge and understanding about how things are and how things can be. And so when, when God comes to you and says, I'm going to do this and this and this for you, you start thinking about how that's all going to happen. And like Abram before us, we probably are like him as we tend to think that we have an idea of how God is going to make things happen. I know that as I've gotten older... And as I have studied and restudied the things that are especially interesting to Adventists about how we believe things will happen, I am convinced of one thing. It hasn't been happening the way we thought it would happen. I don't know about you, but that's where I'm at. And so I'm a little less, maybe even more and more uh, uh, convinced that we should be watching what God is doing because he's doing some amazing things in our day and age that we didn't think would happen, that we didn't think that we would live to see, and it's happening. It's happening. It's his, it's his work after all, and he's doing it. So he brings Abram together with himself, and he tells him that he wants, he wants to uh, make a covenant with him. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty gory story in Genesis 15, and for the sake of the, the children, I will have you read it there because he takes a female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, and he presents them to God by cutting them in half. Next time you go to a wedding, 
realize that we are still cutting covenants. Can you think of the moment at the wedding reception when this happens? The cake. Hours are spent on that cake, and the fondant is put around it, and the beautiful flowers, etc., etc., only to have two hands, usually. We, you know, we like to say, oh, for the pictures. You know, <laughs> put the hand, and then the other hand. But it's a knife, and they are going to destroy. They're going to cut. It's never going to be the same again. I like the African-American tradition. In the days of slavery, when weddings between slaves were not allowed. Can you imagine? They would have a ceremony in their quarters, and they would put a broom down on the ground. And they would stand together, hand in hand, on the one side of the broom. And they would look at each other and say, we are now going to, to transition from not being married to being married. And they would jump into the air. And together they would cross over the broom. They would leave behind the other side and they would land on this side and that was not married and this was married. And as they're in the air together, there's no going back. There's no like, ah, I want to go back. No, 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 no. There's no runaway bride in this story. They're hand in hand and they jump together and they are married when they land on the other side. I love that idea. It's the same thing that's happening here in this story. He cuts these animals. He stays all night. He chases away the vultures. And he has a dream. And in verse 17, he sees a smoking pot. A smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves, the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land now occupied by the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Yes, I did go to seminary. No, you can read those yourselves. But in the midst of that, you have chapter 16. Chapter 16 is Abram trying it all over again. First it was, hey, can we use Eliezer? No, not going to use Eliezer. You're going to have a son. No. Why? This is now Sarai coming and saying, why don't we use my servant girl? Remember I told you it's the extended family? And so if my servant girl has a child with my husband, that child is mine. That was the rule. Ishmael is born. And uh, the rest is history. But let me just remind you, at Abraham's funeral, there were two brothers, half-brothers, that showed up. So in these moments when you think that your family is twisted and crazy and, and, and you're, you're thinking, how on earth can I love these people? Just understand that so was Abram's family. And so, so he did. He had a son who, if you do the math, because we're not going to go through the whole thing today, if you do the math, was in the neighborhood of 17 years of age. So for all you young people here today, imagine, imagine being that age. And then your father has another child with the original wife, the child of promise. And the original wife doesn't like having you and your mother around. Anyone know of any stories like this in our day? We see it happening all the time. 
We see it happening in Santa Clarita. New marriages, new families, and the old one gets thrown away. Would it be that a patriarch in the Bible would do this? You betcha. Sarah said, get rid of her. He gets rid of her. And who comes to her rescue? Speaking of rescue stories, who comes to her rescue out in the desert as she is watching her child starve to death? God comes to her rescue. The God who sees me, El Laroi. And she goes back, and she's told, you need to go back, and you need to be submissive to that very nasty person, Sarai. I'm not making this stuff up. It's here if you want to read it. And if it brings you comfort in this day and age because you are going through some really bad stuff at work or, or in the home, understand that it has all happened before and it has happened in the family of the patriarch of the Abrahamic religions. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all look to this family to say, how shall we live? Crazy, eh? Crazy. So I want to take you over very quickly as we make this conclusion to Romans chapter 4. Having told you this story now, let's re be reminded by Rabbi Paul, Rabbi Saul, who became Rabbi Paul, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What, he, what did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, we would have had something, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. Have we not just seen that with the whole Melchizedek incident or part of the story? But that was God's way, for the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. As we've been going through uh, this idea of love this month, we started out with the idea of loving generously. God has loved us generously. And if we are going to love like God loves, then we should also love generously. Secondly, we, we talked about loving faithfully, and we're somewhat reviewing that by this passage today. That God loves us faithfully, and that he is waiting there, just like Melchizedek was waiting for Abram. And when Abram recognizes Melchizedek, Melchizedek plants a blessing upon him to say, thank you for recognizing that it was not you who did this, that it was the God most high, the creator of heaven and earth that did this. And again, I want to commend you for being here today for, as, as many of us grew up saying, keeping Sabbath. Understand that the whole idea of Sabbath is bound up in this issue where we are deciding by being here that we are going to trust God, that we're going to depend on God, that we're going to have faith in God, not just any God. The first angel's message says, fear God, the God who made heaven and earth. See how that works? See how it's the same God that we're talking about with Abram? And now we're saying, Paul is saying to us here today, when you have faith in that God, he will cause you to be righteous. We just know it rolls off our tongue. Oh, righteous, righteousness by faith. Well, Here's the story, folks. Here's the gory details of a story about our, our faith ancestor, Abraham, and how when he had faith in God to produce, to, to, to take care of him, to, to defend him, that God said, I will attribute 
my righteousness to you. So if you had any, any question as to whether or not what you do saves you, brings back all of the, the things that have been stolen from you, like Abram bringing Lot and all of the baggage back with him, if you think that that is something that you have the power to do in this world, in this life, understand that this story is telling you, Paul is telling you now in the New Testament, it's not going to happen. When people work, their wages are not a gift. Are you hearing Paul today? But something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Sinners are people who have gone their own way, according to Isaiah, who have gone their own way and decided to do their own thing. So just understand those are the two people in the world, people who do what God says and people who do their own thing. So if you have been a person this week who has done or thought your own thing, you are by definition, a sinner. I am, by definition, a sinner. People are accounted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Amen? Amen. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. You ready? This is what David says. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Verse 8. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Your record is clean. If you accept the gift of God declaring you righteous from His perspective... Not your perspective, but from his perspective, then you are cleared of sin. Paul goes on in Romans 4 to set up, and he talks about, he talks about Abram like this in verse 16. So the promise is received by faith. The promise that came through the Israelite nation but that is available to every single human being on planet Earth. This idea of, uh, that he talks about in 4 is circumcised or not circumcised is just a, a, a division between those who were part of a group and those who were not. He is saying both have available to them this choice to depend on God or not. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. I've, I've, I've had discussions recently with some people who, who want to take us back to, to the law of Moses. And I am ready and willing to go because the law of Moses points us to Jesus. And if you cannot see that, then we need to study again. If we have faith like Abram's. For Abram is the father of all who believe. So if you believe today, Abram is your daddy. This is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abram believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. There is only one God, my friends, who can do those things. He is the life giver, and he is going to give life to all those who trust him, even if they die. Hope you don't mind, I was teaching that to your kids today. In the context of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, with the new translation, blessed are those who realize they can't do it themselves, and so they've decided to depend on God. That they realize that God has to do it for them. Even when there was no reason, here's the, here's the big text for today, even when there was no reason for hope, 
Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, this is how many descendants you will have. And Abram's faith did not weaken, even though it was about at, at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abram, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in, and in this, he brought glory to God. So, my friends, if you think that we've been waiting a long time as Adventist people, just understand that it's, it's not how, how long we count it to be, but it's how long God counts it to be. It's not long. In the whole grand scheme of things, it's not long. It's very short, in fact. And we can say that because God is dragging his feet to come back, it might just be because he wants a few more of his human family to come home with him. You ever, call, you, you ever prayed, oh, Jesus, please come back. I hope you pray the next stanza of that prayer. But Lord, but Lord, there's a few people that I need you to contact because I want to live forever in your kingdom with them. Yeah? I hope you pray that stanza as well. And maybe he's not come back because there are people that he hasn't been able to get through to yet. That's the grace. That's the mercy of God. And when we depend on him for our own salvation, we'll also be depending on him for the salvation of our family, our friends, and for so many people that we don't even know. So many people that he wants. In fact, he wants the whole world. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Verse 22, and because of Abram's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abram's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too. Thank you, Apostle Paul, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, and he handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Hallelujah. We have this hope. We have this love that we can love hopefully because of Jesus, because he has saved us just as surely as Abram went after Lot and saved him and all his possessions. God is going to send and has sent Jesus, and he's going to send him again to save us and all of our ideas if you like, we say, oh, no, he's not going to save our possessions. My, my wife wanted to know, and her father was happy to oblige, is he going to bring my dog back to life? You know, I say, and Paul says, this is a God who can do anything. Amen. He knows the DNA of your favorite dog or dogs because you've lived long enough now to have five. He knows your family. He knows the people that mean something to you. He, he knows that Norm and Denise are traveling to see Norm's mom. He knows what's going on with her. He knows this stuff, and he loves us, and he wants us to depend on him. Now, that's where it gets difficult. That's where it gets difficult, because every day that we wake up and we jump on the 14 or we jump on the 5 and we go to work or maybe it's right here in Santa Clarita, we go to work. We are pulled by another force that is saying, depend on me or depend on yourself because you have to do it. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't work. Believe me, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is we shouldn't depend on that work to save us or our families ultimately. 
So as we, as we go forth, I hope this week we will, we will remember Abram who because of the covenant, because of the belief that he had in God was made into Abraham. Abraham, father of a great nation. May God make you into a great nation of people who depend on him, hopefully. Amen.